In this video, we'll talk about the dual bases and define the dual basis vectors. But first, let's suppose that I have a regular vector v with components v super 1, v super 2, all the way to v super n, where n is the dimension of the space I'm in. I can write my regular vector v a bunch of ways. I can write it as a column vector like so, but I can also write it as a linear combination of these basis vectors, e sub 1, e sub 2, all the way to e sub n, scalar multiplied by the corresponding components, v super 1, v super 2, etc. I'll call this equation 1. Let's also suppose that I have a dual vector d, which is described by these covariant components d sub i, where i varies from 1 to n. We've mentioned in the last couple of videos that we can write a dual vector as a row vector with the elements d sub i. So a regular vector is written as a column vector and a dual vector is written as a row vector. So far, so good. Now, just like with regular vectors in equation 1, we can also write the dual vector d as a linear combination involving another set of basis vectors, which are called the dual basis vectors. So if I have a set of dual basis vectors, which I'll denote using e super 1, e super 2, all the way to e super n, I can write my dual vector d as d sub 1 times e super 1 plus d sub 2 times e super 2, all the way to d sub n times e super n. I'll call this equation 2. We've now got equations 1 and 2, which represent ways of expressing a regular vector and a dual vector in terms of their respective sets of basis vectors. But let's go on the side and remember what a dual vector actually is in tensor analysis. It's an operation on the regular contravariant vector v that returns the inner product of v and the vector d that corresponds to the dual vector d. It takes a vector, a contravariant vector, spits out the dot product, which is a real number, and it also is a linear operation because the dot product is a linear operator. And that's what we want from a dual vector in general. It has to be a linear operation that returns a real number as the output. We also mentioned in our previous videos that another way of calculating the result of this dual vector operation is to do a straight up matrix multiplication of the row vector corresponding to d and the column vector corresponding to v, which would then give you the following when expanded out fully. I'll call this equation 3. But now let's use the fact that the dual vector represents a linear operation to evaluate d of v with a separate calculation. Instead of using v straight up, I'm going to use equation 1 to write v in terms of the linear combination involving its basis vectors. And because the dual vector operation is a linear operation, I can break up this expression on the right into the linear combination of a bunch of dual vector operations on each of the regular basis vectors. Now, let's go even deeper. Let's isolate the dual vector operating on some basis vector e sub i and show what that's going to turn out to be. Using equation 2, we can break up this operation into its components like so. We'll have d sub 1 times e super 1 of e sub i plus d sub 2 times e super 2 of e sub i plus all the way to d sub i times e super i of e sub i plus all the way to d sub n times the dual basis vector e super n operating on the regular basis vector e sub i. This time I've got the d sub 1, 2, 3, etc. components as my scalars that are multiplying the corresponding dual basis vectors operating on the regular basis vector e sub i. So for example, if I'm operating my dual vector d on e sub 1, the first regular basis vector, this is what I'll get. I'll now plug this back into my equation for my dual vector operating on v to get the following. Let's now expand out the term in the brackets. When we do that, this is what we'll have. I'll call this equation 4. We'll now compare this to equation 3. Of course, equation 3 and equation 4 represent the same thing. They both represent the dual vector d operating on the regular vector v. It's just that equation 4 is a slightly expanded version where I've written things in terms of the regular basis vectors and to some extent the dual basis vectors. And if I compare these two equations, I'll see that this whole term in brackets in equation 4 actually equals the first term in equation 3. The v super 1 components cancel to give me the following slightly simplified equation. Now the only term on the left hand side that contains a d sub 1 is the first term. This leads me to conclude that the dual basis vector e super 1 operating on the regular basis vector e sub 1 just gives me 1, but the dual basis vector e super 1 operating on any other basis vector has to give you 0. Now I can come up with very similar equations if I look at the dual vector d operating on other basis vectors like e sub 2, e sub 3, and so on. 
what I'll find is that in general, my dual basis vector E super J applied to the regular basis vector E sub I is just the Kronecker delta symbol. So 1 if I and J are equal and 0 if I and J are different. And this is one way to define the dual basis. The dual basis is the set of dual basis vectors E super J, which when applied to the corresponding regular basis vectors E sub I result in the Kronecker delta symbol. 1 if the J and I indices match, 0 if they don't. So each set of regular basis vectors typically has a corresponding set of dual basis vectors, and that's how we define those dual basis vectors here. Now, one question you might ask, what are some applications of dual basis vectors? What's their use? Well, for one, we can use them to isolate components of our regular vectors to project them out, essentially. Let me explain. If I apply some dual vector E super J to my regular vector V, then that's the same as operating E super J on this expanded out version of V, which I got from equation one. But because this is a linear operation, it's equivalent to operating E super J on each of these components of the regular vector V. Now from the definition of the dual basis vector, all the components are gonna cancel except for the component where the dual basis vector E super J operates on the regular basis vector E sub J, which will leave me with B super J as my final answer since this operation is just one. So here I've used the dual basis vector E super J to project out the Jth component of the regular vector V to essentially isolate that component. And that's kind of why dual basis vectors have a superscript on them for indexing. It's because they're used to isolate contravariant vector components. Remember, contravariant components have a superscript, covariant components have a subscript. Now this projection mirrors what regular basis vectors can do for you. That is, regular basis vectors can isolate or project out covariant components, such as those from the dual vector D. So if I apply my dual vector D to the ith basis vector E sub I, I get the following. We actually came up with this equation earlier in the video. And again, from the definition of the dual basis vector, everything on the right-hand side cancels except for this term, where the E super I operates on E sub I. This is just one, so in the end you just have D sub I remaining. So that's one application of dual basis vectors, which is to project out contravariant components. And now there is the metric tensor, specifically the inverse metric tensor. You can actually define the inverse metric tensor in terms of dual basis vectors. The inverse metric tensor component G super Ki is just the inner product of the dual basis vector E super K with E super I. This is in contrast to the regular metric tensor component G sub Ij, which is the inner product of E sub I and E sub J. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.